tonight, uh, our focus is going to be on, on a recent biobash that was held at Oberg uh, Nature Reserve in the mountains behind Montague in the Western Cape, uh, a beautiful part of the country that I'm looking forward to getting to sometime. Hopefully, I'll be able to join one of the, one of the future biobashes to be held at Oberg. Uh, Sue Gee is the, uh, is the team leader. It's, uh, it's uh, um, Sue's property on which the uh, biobash takes place. And the, the first one was held not too long ago. So uh, if the presenters could, could maybe uh, include some comparison between the first and the second biobash, I think that would be very interesting, but um, that's up to you. Um, Sue will, uh, will be the main presenter this evening, but there will also be a, sh a short presentations by um, Chorus Daniel, who will be talking about bird pick, tell us about the bird atlas activities during the, uh, the bio bash, as well as bird ringing. And then Ryan will uh, finish up the presentations talking about the Odonata in, uh, in Oberg Nature Reserve and the surrounding area. It has traveled a little bit more widely than the, just the nature reserve itself. So we look forward very much to uh, the second set of presentations on Oberg and the Biobash there. And I think that uh, if you're ready, Sue, I'll hand over to you immediately. If well, uh, welcome to our um, little presentation on the, for the 21st, 21st birthday Biobash. <laughs> I mean, report back, that is. Um, okay, so... Um, um, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous. So anyway, here we go. All right. So this is um, the, uh, our second biobash that we have hosted. So the farm is owned by my husband and myself. And um, we call it a private nature reserve. It's not official yet, but part of all these biobashes will be contributing towards getting that protected status. So already we are getting lots of value out of these wonderful biobashes. So um, the biobash was held at the beginning of, of February, so when it's nice and hot. And, and the last one was in October, from the 17th to the 25th of October. So that was um, sort of um, springtime and the farm was beautiful and green. Um, and this time it was quite brown and crispy. Um, so to explain to um, you where um, for some of you who have not seen uh, where we are before. Okay, so the farm is situated in the western extreme of the um, Little Karoo. Um, so the Little Karoo is broadly this sort of area. Um, so in the south sort of western um, part of South Africa, um, in the Western Cape. Its closest town is Montague, which is probably somewhere over here. Um, so, and about 250 odd k's from, um, from Cape Town. So it falls still within the winter rainfall um, area, but um, because of this chain of mountains along here, part of the Cape Fold Mountains, in particular the Langeberg mountain range, we are in a bit of a rain shadow, so hence our semi-arid um, climate low rainfall um, between 230 and 400 odd millimeters per annum. Um, we've just come out of a, about a five year drought. And so this last 2020 winter, we had some really, really decent rain. I'm not actually sure how much we had, but oh, it was beautiful. And we saw it in springtime and the other um, biobashes can um, attest to how beautiful it was. Um, now it's looking dry and crispy as all the plants um, cope with the extreme heat that we had. So we had, I think every day, minimum 28 and we went up to 40 odd degrees while we were biobashing. So it was hot. What's also interesting about this area is that it's, um, this particular area, is it's an intersection of two major biomes, the succulent Karoo and the subtropical thicket biome. Um, and also on our farm and other areas um, in that sort of area, where you have a bits of um, sandstone coming in, we have some proteoid fainbos biome coming in. So it's a whole like mosaic of vegetation types 
um, and um, yeah, so we call this sort of blend and where, where biomes meet, we call that an ecotone. So you have some interesting and unique and highly diverse vegetation, which of course then goes um, to, to um, is also shown in, in the, the fauna, but not that we have large animals, but we do have many, many small animals, um, in particular insects, that's for sure. Anyways, so the animals, they are small and hardy and are really, really good survivors. Okay, just a, a quick out, outline of, of um, um, location again, but also the geolocation um, of um, Oberg. And this is important for the biomapping part and how we as citizen scientists contribute in particular to the virtual museums and to the atlasing. Um, so this, this um, map is taken from one of the virtual museums. Um, so as you know, the world is divided by humans into latitude and longitude, so we can find a way around the world <coughs> and not get too lost anyway. Um, so um, each, um, hmm. so the, this little pink area is a, a degree cell, so that's basically, this will be 20 degrees, let me make sure I've got this right, 20 degrees east, this one's 21 degrees east, this is 30 degrees south, and uh, yeah, 33 degrees south, this will be 34 degrees south, okay? So within, Oberg is located within this degree cell. And then if you divide, you can divide the degree cells, the cartographers do this to help with geolocation into smaller um, quadrats. So quadrat within this would be A, B, C, and D. And um, again, Oberg is located within the smaller quadrat, quadrat C. And again, it's divided into four smaller quadrats. Um, and now that little quadrat is now called a quarter degree grid cell. And it's 15 minutes by 15 minutes. That is the size of that, that quadrat. And um, this is where most of the biobashing happened but um, not, not exclusively at all. We looked at some neighboring qu um, quarter degree cells and other quarter degree cells en route and away from the farm as well. Then also for um, um, the, the, the people that are involved in um, bird atlasing, so part contributing data to the South African Bird Atlas Project, they use a much finer scale, which are called pentads. So that quarter degree cell, geez, I hope I've got this right, is divided into um, nine pentads. Each pentad is five minutes by five minutes. So if you take uh, 20, uh, yeah, um, the, this um, 3320 CB um, grid divided up, okay, into nine pentads. We in this one, Felicity, I hope I've got this right, 33, 40, 20, 15. They can correct me later if I'm wrong. Um, so that's how it works. So here I've now zoomed in. This is our pink um, um, quarter degree cell. Here this is, so you can give you an idea of size of the area. Um, this is where Oberg is. This is approximately where it's located. Is African Game Lodge, which we also got access to. And so we tried to get into much of this area as we could um, to um, focus on our quest for birds and, and, and dragonflies and other creatures. So here you can see um, basically what the landscape and the vegetation um, looks like. This is on, on the farm. These, these photos were actually taken sort of uh, in winter to spring. So this is possible at the moment it would be regarded as lumo green compared to what it looks like now, which is more like the satellite image. So what did we contribute towards um, on this particular biobash? The focus was the Odonata map, so that is dragonflies and damselflies, as well as um, birds, and birds in two ways. So firstly, through the virtual museum's bird pics, so as we go out and you photograph um, birds, those bird pictures are uploaded to the virtual museum, curated and uh, contribute towards a distribution map of the different bird species in particular areas. The other one was through, as I've mentioned, the, um, um, the Bird Atlas Project, 
and then which follows a distinct, uh, a proper pro a scientific protocol of logging the birds that are seen and that is, is um, uploaded as well. And then we had also just um, half a day of bird ringing so that that data goes to the South African bird ringing unit, if I've got that right. Okay, other um, of parts of the virtual museum that we uh, landed up contributing data to on this particular bio well, The wonderful thing about these bio bashes, and my focus is really gonna be to talk more from, a, from an experience and a, and a people perspective. Um, so the, the, the great thing is that it brings people together who have similar interests, in fact, more like a passion and for being outdoors, for finding interesting things and to go on quests to see what, what we can find. It's like a massive treasure hunt. My family fondly, and a couple of my friends also fondly refer to us as the nerd herd. So I'm a, I'm a proud member of, of this fabulous nerd herd that we are. Okay, so um, so we hosted the, the Spire Bash um, and the other team members were um, Ryan, Ryan Tippett, Karis Daniel, uh, Prof. Les Underhill, um, Helene, Sharon, and Felicity. Um, and they all contributed in various wonderful ways. We were always armed with cameras and binoculars, um, right from drinking our coffee on the, on the stoop in the mornings and always leaping up and staring at weird and wonderful things. Um, oh, I forgot Nunzi. Nunzi was also a very faithful uh, participant in, in um, the Biobash this year. Um, then we always have, having Les um, with us, it always makes things interesting as Les is a statistician. So his, his take on this and always may helping us um, realize, you know, the, the connection between what we're doing um, and as people and as well as from the citizen science side. So seven people at the Biobash, that means a list of 21 pairs of people or 21 friendships, 12 of those who were new, in addition to our team contribution to biodiversity, perhaps an even more important achievement is 21 friendships, which were strengthened. 12 um, of these were new and nine of them were refreshed. And you will hear about new data and refreshed things as we're going along in this. So this is, but this is a very, very important part of the bio bashing is meeting people and learning. Um, <clears throat> so an important role of the biodiversity um, and development institutes, so the BDI, and their coordinated um, bio bash and biomapping events is that connections are also made with landowners. And for scientists gathering data that requires um, field work, um, a tricky aspect is always obtaining permission to gain access to privately owned land. And the same holds true for citizen scientists, except of course we don't get to have, you know, like the, the creds, the credentials and flash pieces of paper and say, you know, you know we're doing this marvelous stuff and we are doing marvelous stuff, but difficult to really show. Um, and of course, landowners are, are not going to be keen to allow just anybody onto their property. So by meeting landowners through other organizations, online webinars like this one, through data actually uploaded um, to um, the virtual museums, and more effectively by literally driving around and bumping into landowners while biobashing, invitations to walk around some farms have indeed happened. So this, um, this is um, if also very important if one is trying to able to survey a grid cell and you can see how big a grid cell is um, and it's full of a variety of different habitats. So if you can gain access to those habitats, then obviously the data that you get um, is going to be um, far more useful and reflective of um, um, the, habitats, the habitats around there. So Les, um, is a master at winning people over. And thanks to a connection he made at last year's Oberg Bio Bash, um, we were able to visit a, a beautiful farm called Kreisrefir up in the other end of um, the quarter degree grid cell that our farm is in. Sharon and Helene got access to a, a beautiful private farm, this one, um, a reserve in the mountains above Montague. And Felicity and I got to be day visitors at African Game Lodge, and it was all through connections. 
and and through this you develop better connections and um, you're able to share knowledge and experiences and yeah expand the excitement we hope okay from a personal perspective some little highlights for me the two lifers sorry the pictures are not fab but when you buy bashing it's not about you know, how pretty the picture is it's just get get the get the shot and um, so um this little birdie is a um, spotted flycatcher. It's a migrant, a Paleo-Arctic migrant, if I'm correct. So yeah, thank you, Les, for helping me spot that one. It's really, really um, beautiful bird and um, amazing that it flies from so far away. And now it's here in the middle of the Karoo uh, above a tiny little half dried out pan um, hawking insects. It was amazing. And then this bird is a Karoo Eremamala um, and we encountered, Les and I encountered a, a, probably a family group of them um, chattering away in the scrub bushes along the side of the road. Some other um, important highlights um, and to affirm presence on Oberg, um, they were, have been recorded in the, in the quarter degree grid cell. Um, so this little birdie is a Cape Battis. So I'd seen it a couple of years ago um, on the farm, and then I haven't seen it since. So I thought, well, maybe I've misidentified it. Um, thought maybe um, maybe it was a prurit batis, which um, um, which I have seen quite a few times. Um, so seeing this um, and last week with Felicity was fantastic. So definitely we have cat batis on on the farm, and then this this gorgeous bird is a rufous eared warbler. Um, which has been, I think, recorded on the farm before, but I haven't seen it. So we got my first record of this lovely bird. Then some other um, birds that are around, which I just enjoy, is this one is the fairy flycatcher. Um, very difficult to, to photograph because they don't sit still for two seconds and um, always buried in the bushes somewhere usually. And they are the smallest let me get this right, smallest bird by mass in Southern Africa with an average mass of six grams. So that's quite a thing. And then this uh, bird is a Gabar goshawk, which we saw that at Cross Refuge sitting perfectly and beautifully for us. And it is um, smaller than the pale chanting goshawks, which you see just about everywhere. So that was a really, really special um, record as well. So as mentioned before, um, other little creatures we have we managed to um, photograph. Um, so the various lepidopterans, so this was a butterfly on the farm. Okay, I don't know all these names of these things, so I'll wait till other people speak. Um, some dragonflies. Um, this frog was on our neighbor's farm. It might be a Cape River frog. I haven't had time to sit and identify it properly. Ryan, you're gonna have to help me remind me what this is. It's, um, it's, a, it's quite amazing. Um, and then obviously we've, we've also got camera traps on the farm and so we did have kudu visiting actually while we were sleeping there on the biobash. This picture was taken just before the biobash um, and uh, so at the waterhole just in front of the house. So we do have one or two records from the camera trap as well. Um, so we also did some um, bird ringing. So Felicity is a bird ringer and Karis is in training. And I just mostly scribed and went ooh and ah and took all the lovely photographs and learned a little bit more about bird ringing. But it's just, just such an amazing thing to do. So we've got a few more birdies with a little bit of bling around their legs now on the farm. I think we had two recaptures, but I'll leave that for Felicity. Then we had a really cute and um, fun experience. And, and thank goodness that it, um, it was found in the morning. Got a little pool at the end of our stoop and um, I'm not sure who did it, but because I woke up a little bit later, um, this little shrew was rescued from the pool and it's a first record um, for um, the farm. It's a red, let me get this right, red something musk shrew. <laughs> Just gone completely blank. Reddish gray musk shrew is its name. Very, very cute. And was released back into the farm. Um, then what um, came out of one of uh, Les's um, records 
we were driving uh, back towards the farm after a morning of bio bashing and um, we <clears throat> came across this little almost dry um, pan on the side of the road so of course we had to leap out the car and inspect it immediately um, and came across some nice birds and one or two dragonflies and damsels and then Les photographed um, this uh, butterfly um, called Lysina Clarkey, Clarkey. and um, then um, it was pointed out to Les um, via email um, about its, um, its host plant, well the host plant for the larva. So the larvae feeds on, on this particular plant Rumex lanceolatus. So this plant grows in sort of wetland kind of areas um, and um, it is, is a, of, of the sorrel family if I've got it correct. And if you look at the two distribution maps you get this. This is so cool I think. Um, so this is from the virtual museum, the Lepi Museum for Lysina Clarke, all the records so by um, citizen scientists as well as historical records. And then this map is taken from um, Sanby's website, um, looking at the distribution of Rumex lanceolatus. And look at that lovely overlap of, of distribution of where, you, where the butterfly occurs. Definitely nice strong correlation, um, just from sight anyway, um, with the distribution of its uh, host plant species. And that's, um, it is, is quite important. There's an article um, in the Felton Flora, December's Felton Flora, about um, butterflies, in particular the butterflies of the savannah, and how transformation in the savannah um, by um, fewer of the of the um, ecosystem engineers like the elephant and, and the big grazers. So therefore there's bush encroachment happening and so on. And the, um, many of the butterfly species, their host plants are forbs. So the soft weedy plants that, that most of us, well, most of us um, dislike because they've got thorns and prickles and stick to us and so on. But um, what's really important is that um, what can be seen is, is potentially um, is that the butterflies become then an indicator species of of habitat change. So by doing some more distribution maps, uh, past and present, um, hopefully one can start tracking changes and then asking the necessary questions and, and moving on. So the importance of citizen science is right here. Um, so for, as, as a landowner, the values of, of having biobashes, of being involved in citizen science, um, for me are, are, are sort of threefold. So it's to do with firstly the knowledge, it's also to do with the human interaction and it's to do with connecting and being um, um, with nature. So by adding to, for example, the species list, both plants and animals, it contributes to um, us getting um, recognized as an area that needs to be and should be conserved and protected so that it doesn't get mined or fracked or mowed over or whatever the case may be in the future because um, uh, it has a valuable contribution. Um, also just, just to learn about what's there when you're interacting with fellow citizen scientists and scientists you're seeing things through different lenses more eyes wider perspectives and the the learning just is just fantastic and it's a lot of fun um you're meeting our neighbors which was just wonderful so we'll be able to set up better connections um that way as well um and sharing up our farm with with other people um whether they're citizen scientists or not and just hopefully getting them to reconnect with um out of the city anyway. So other things, um, you know, we had lots of fun driving around kilometers and kilometers in this beautiful Klein Karua, little Karoo. We made many friends, not only of the two-legged variety, so this little pup followed us the whole way around the Kreis Rufi farm. Um, the, mercifully, the little lamb didn't follow us all the way, it would have been a bit worrying. Yeah, we ate well, got ostrich eggs, we made, we had some really nice records and really nice sightings. 
So we worked hard. It's not, not just all fun and games. So that's just a very, very brief overview of um, what happened. And uh, I'd just like to thank ev everyone that contributed and especially the people behind the scenes that are have been spending hours identifying our sometimes really not so great photographs and trying to identify um, uh, our birds and lace wings and so on. Yeah, so thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, <clears throat> thanks for giving us, giving us that introduction again. I think without further ado, yeah, we'll move straight on to, to Chorus um, to tell us about the bird picks results. Brilliant. Right. Can everyone see the screen okay? Good. Great. Perfect. Okay. Looks good. Thanks. Okay, so um, thanks Sue and thank you Rick. Um, I'm glad that Sue actually started with doing a bit of an introduction to how the quarter degree grid system works because I'm going to sort of walk through the week by quarter degree grid cells that we covered and show you where we were on the map and then a bit of habitat in each area and then I'll highlight some of the records that we collected in each one and I'm going to try and be time conscious but please keep me to that. Um, so February 3rd was the day that most of us left um, home and started heading towards Oberg and Felicity was atlasing, which she's going to talk about next, and Les and I were collecting records for the virtual museum along the way. And we stopped at this low level bridge, which you can see in the photo here, um, over the Breda River, which is, and we were south of Worcester. And we've stopped there several times in the past because it often has really interesting dragonflies and has quite a few birds. Um, it's in the grid cell 3319 DC, which is here on the map, that little pink square. And if I expand that so you can see a bit better. Um, what's really cool is that we added the first records for the year 2021 to the grid cell. And that was really a recurring theme throughout the trip. A lot of the grid cells that we did visit hadn't had any submissions yet in 2021. So there were a lot of firsts. And these are the records that we refreshed and added on. And um, there was only one species added on. It was this pied kingfisher up in the top corner. But um, we refreshed 26 species. Um, so the total number of species for the grid cell has moved up from 75 to 76. And many of those records are now quite recent as well, which is fantastic. So on February 4th, um, I also spent with Les. We went over the Oberg Pass and then we went east towards an iceberg. And we covered two grid cells on that side. And um, Les likes to talk about this road. It's quite a spectacular road <laughs> because of the iceberg for the first, which you can see um, in the photo in the lower right hand corner. Um, but it's a lot of the same habitat type for quite some time. And then you come to this sudden bend on the right and it just drops down into a beautiful valley um, with irrigated farmland and really interesting rock formations and just completely different habitat. And the photo on the top right corner here is taken at the bottom of that valley. Um, so we did cover two grid cells, these two pink ones in the photo. Um, and I'll start with 3320DA, the one further west, which was that valley in the, the bottom photo, and then we'll hop over to DB. So we probably spent close to 35 or 40 minutes walking around in the valley just photographing whatever we could find. And it really did pay off. Um, we were able to refresh 17 species. And again, the photos were the first records for 2021. And almost all, um, if not all of the previous records for that grid cell were from myself and Les and Ichaso and Sue in September last year. So it was really cool to go back and recover that area. And when coverage is so sparse in a region, it's relatively easy to make quite a big impact. So we added almost as many new species as we refreshed. We added 15 species, which is fantastic. Um, and some of them can be tricky to get photos of. Um, so things like Alpine Swift and White Ramp Swift, Forktailed Drongo. Um, and when we were in the valley, we met a woman who farmed there and she very kindly invited us to have a look at the dam on their property to see if there were any birds there. And that very briefly took us into the next grid cell, which is 3320 DB on the right. And I think we were expecting like a small cement farm dam and not this. It was actually quite impressive. Um, and though most of the birds were quite far back, we were able to add at least um, five new species. Um, 
we added the water thickney, yellow canary, cape bunting, white-throated swallow, and African spoonbill. And we refreshed a few others, um, including the PCG up in the top left corner, the pelt chant and gossok. And I think that was last recorded in 2019 when I checked. So it was a nice update. Um, then on the 6th of February, um, as Sue already mentioned, she and Les went to Christ Rafia, which is in 3320 AD. Um, just a reminder of where that is. So now we're on the north side of the iceberg. And they made a fantastic contribution. They were able to refresh 20 species, again, the first records for the year. And they added six new birds. And Sue has mentioned some of these already. Um, the Gabar Goshawk and the Spotted Flycatcher were among them. Um, but yeah, some really nice updates. And they also got Cardinal Woodpecker, which is always nice to get a photo of. And finally, Oberg, um, which is where we stayed. Um, we covered it as we were coming and going and wherever we were able. Um, and again, just a quick reminder of where it is on the map in 3320CB. And what's really cool is that we added um, at least 10 species, even in just coming and going. We were still able to make quite a big difference in how up-to-date records are as well. And we refreshed loads of species. I think it was 53 the last time I checked um, this afternoon, but some records are still pending, some are still being submitted, so those numbers are subject to change. Um, and added at least 10, but some are still trickling in, and I know I still have one sacred ibis, which Liesl caught in a photo, and I need to submit that as well. So um, I spent, oops, sorry, getting ahead of myself. I spent a day with um, Felicity um, taking photos while she was atlasing pentads within this grid cell, and we did get some interesting finds, like um, the Layard's warbler in the bottom left corner, and um, we had a fish eagle in Hammerkop, and when Sue and Felicity went to African Game Lodge um, together, which is the neighboring property, they added on things like the Spowing Goose and the Great Heron and Greaves at the dam there. Um, and then the Cape Battis, which Sue mentioned. And I noticed just this afternoon, um, this red-eyed dove in the top right, which Ryan found and photographed um, was confirmed. And that's a new species for the grid cell as well. So that was a cool add-on just today. Um, so this is, one way <laughs> to visualize the scope of what we achieved as a team um, just during the bio bash. And I hope I haven't missed any here, but this is including our journeys out from Cape Town. Um, we covered 20 quarter degree grid cells in the Western Cape just for bird picks. And that was a collective effort. Um, some of those were records from, from Ryan and from Sharon and Helene when they were looking for dragonflies. Um, and it really, it just goes to show that for virtual museum records, it pays to be curious about everything because every photo you take is really, really valuable. Um, and this team was able to make a fantastic contribution this week, um, not just to bird picks, but to a number of projects. So that is the update on bird picks. Thanks very much, Chorus. Excellent. And. Uh... You know, you're, you're an old hand at uh, putting these presentations together. So thank you very much for the way in which you do that. Uh, that was that was tremendous. Okay, Felicity, your your uh, your turn to share with us about um, uh, um, the bird atlasing and bird ringing. Over to you. So, atlasing and ringing two things that I was involved in there. I did take some of them and I've been atlasing a long time. And one of the things I enjoy with atlasing is if I'm going on a holiday somewhere or a trip somewhere is to actually look at the maps and find pentads that haven't been done before or haven't been atlased often and then plan my journey around those. Um, this is just saying one of the things I do is I look for lists that Pentads that have very few lists or haven't been at this recently or haven't been at this in a particular season. The other thing I often do is try and find pentads on the route that I can atlas sort of on the way there and back because often they're far away from places where people stay and otherwise they're not going to get done. So on the way to uh, Oberg, I was going along the R60, which has been at this fairly well. So what I did was looked at last year's coverage, and then I saw that Nay hadn't been at this last year. So I thought, okay, that'll be a good one to do this year. And it's quite a nice pentad because it's got dams 
and an access road off the main road so that you can actually stop and look at birds and things. So that was one way to choose a pentad to do on the way there. And while I was atlasing, I actually did manage to get some photos. I got the citrus swallowtail, a nice easy butterfly to photograph. And then um, when I got back and I uploaded it, I discovered it hadn't been, it only the second time been recorded in that area. And last one was in 1990, so that was quite good. And then I got a few bird pics as well. These are the pentads that we covered around the farm. This is the pentad that the farm's in. And the reason it's orange is because someone else had already atlased it this year, but the others we were the first to atlas. Um, this pentad at the bottom I did on the way in and out because if I'm driving through the area, I may as well add another list to the list we're doing. This was the farmhouse one and there's sort of a collective effort and we managed to add two species, one of them being that Cape Battis that has been spoken about already. This is the pentad that the um, African Game Lodge is in and Sue with her contacts got us in there and we, we did only the fourth list for the pentad so that was great and we managed to add five species to the Atlas bird list so we've done quite well in adding species in various places. Just some photos from there. Sue was taking photos while and then helping me at this. Yeah, we went onto the dam because it was a butter dragonfly flying up and down there. But obviously, when we got near, it just flew away over the dam wall. But Sue then got some photographs of the birds in there. They were very helpful to us at the African Game Lodge. They gave us a map which was not really to scale but we could find our way to this dam. And they also gave us a radio in case we got stuck because then they said they didn't have to worry about us if we had a radio to contact them. Then one of the days I went atlasing with Karis, she was taking photographs and helping me atlas and then I was keeping the lists. We did these two pentads. Both of them we added new species. Again, this one was only the fourth list for the for the square since 2007 when the atlas just started so we're doing quite well there. This pentad was quite interesting because we added eight species all of them were along this bit of road and obviously other people that have atlas there just carried on there and there's a dam over here and a lot of our species were from the dam there. Um, right and then we were ringing the one morning we set up the nets at the ridge at the back of the farmhouse and very civilized place to ring sitting on the stoop with the kitchen and everything close by and Chorus and Sue and I then were ringing. We got 14 birds which is not too bad, eight different species, a whole lot of Cape Sparrows and then a whole lot of different other species. Two retraps, this olive thrush and a Cape Robin chat, both of them were ringed by Dita in October last year when they were ringing. Um, here's some of the other birds we got. We got two species of mouse birds, which for me was fun because usually the mouse birds don't hang around in the net long, wait long enough to be caught. The pied barbet and this cute little they are, uh, chestnut vented tit babbler, and then quite a lot of Cape Sparrows. A lot of them were sort of getting the adult plumage you could see various speckles and spots and not quite proper blackheads and things that was interesting to look at um yeah so that was my bit great thanks very much i i, I love the diversity of uh, of uh, involvement in activities, as Sue was saying, you know, getting, getting, and, and those of us who've attended these bio bashes, it's wonderful, uh, getting these groups of, of people together, each with their, their own particular areas of interest and, uh, and expertise. And um, so thanks Felicity very much for sharing that with us. Wonderful. And it's always nice to see people working together um, on different aspects of uh, a bio bash. Time, uh, time for Ryan to do 
tell us about the Odonata of the area. Ryan, over to you. Right. Um, hi, Ryan, everybody. Um, great. Okay, I'm just going to give a bit of a report back on on the from the bio bash to do with Odonata. So. Um, if it will work, it doesn't want to move. Okay, sorry, I'm, my computer's a bit slow right now. So the aims that we had for the for the bash um, are essentially to to collect records from as many quarter degree squares as were feasible over the the three or four days to gather as many records of species, different species as possible. Um, an important one at the moment um, is to actually just refresh older records. There's a desperate need to actually refresh the, the records as, as has been spoken about already, but I'll touch on that a little bit um, shortly. Um, we also wanted to add to the species lists in the various quarter degree squares. Many of the squares in the region right, that we covered haven't got a huge amount of species recorded, so, so that was another goal. All right. So this is the area uh, that we, we were looking at. So it's in the Robertson, Ashton, Montague, Swillendon, Barrydale areas. So we covered quite um, a big, a large piece of land. So this is an area where that red star is. That's where um, Sharon and Helene went to Simons Kloof Nature Reserve. Um, this was Dussie's Hook Nature Reserve just above Robertson. Um, we covered a few places in Montague itself, the Casey River that runs through the town and, um, and, and the surrounds. It's also got a few tributaries that come in as well as the Montague Nature Reserve or Montague Nature Garden, which has got some, it's, it's a bit of a, a garden, I suppose, but it, it does have quite interesting dragonfly habitat. And then um, that last star is where we were based at Obach, um, at Sue's place, which um, isn't exactly a perfect place for dragonflies in the sense that it's in a quite a dry environment, yet we've found, I think, 10 species to date on the farm. So I think it's pretty decent for somewhere in the, the little Karoo. Then over here down just above Swellendam, we have Marleth Nature Reserve, which was a, a, a big spot to visit on, on my list, um, which we'll get to just now. And then the Trudeau Pass cuts up through the Langebach Mountains. And then we have the, the Hayes Rafir there at Barrydale. Those were the, the most important sites that we visited. Um, there were others along the way, various rivers and streams and ponds and pools and dams that, that we spotted and stopped at that produced a couple of species. So just a couple of pictures. This is one of um, Helene at um, the Simons Kloof Nature Reserve, which is some nice dry um, feinbos. Um, with, but you can still see some, some water. It is a dry season down that side. Um, this is the Hastrophy at Barrydale. Um, interestingly, on the second picture, you can see the fires in the background. I don't know, uh, it was on the news, some of the news at, at a point uh, when we were there. And uh, this photo was taken, well, I actually took a photo the day after when I visited that site and it had been burned to the ground, but um, I don't have that picture anymore. Um, but there were still several species present. Um, this is a picture you've seen already from Lairs and Karis when they would cross the Breda River. Um, Marleth Nature Reserve near Swellendam is where I spent a bit of time and um, fantastic mountainous habitat with um, nice indigenous forest as well as Feinbos and a few streams that came, came off the slopes. Um, with some nice steep forested ravines and some, yeah, good habitat. And then Dussie's Hook near Robertson, which has got a little stream that flows through um, down there where you can see those trees. So those were the main spots. And then this is a map that Chorus made for us, which is um, showing the coverage pretty much over the 
the first part of February, from the 2nd to the 9th of February, from Odonata Map in the Western Cape. So uh, I think we, if I'm not mistaken, we actually recorded 35 species. Not all of these um, quarter degree squares were filled in on the bash, but I think we covered about 17 quarter degree squares and found 35 different species, which is not bad. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just want to give you a quick summary of a couple of the spots. So, so this one is the, the, the I suppose the main quarter degree square that we, we looked at was Montague itself, uh, which you can see sits up in the top center. And um, it's 3320cc. Um, so just to give you, this is now the second bio bash we've done in, in the, that area. Before the first bio bash, which was in October 2020, there were eight species recorded for this quarter degree square. After the bash, the first bash, we had 15 species on the, the, the list. So it's an increase of seven. And then after this second bio bash, we've now added another nine species to it to give the, the quarter degree square a total of 24 species, which is not, not a bad total. And it's got a lot more to offer in future. So this is the, the actual list. If you take away a few of the, the species that were that are identified to species, you'll see that it, it comes to, to 24 species. So I just wanted to show you a couple of the species just to mention about them. The powder-faced sprite, we recorded um, a couple of times, I think, on this bash now, three times, and it, it's actually a refresh. The, the previous record was from 1997. So that's a refresh after 23 years. So I think this is, we did get some quite important um, finds. And the interesting one also is the long skimmer. Uh, try, um, that one was found, sorry, I'm just trying to find my notes here. 1983 was the last record of it. And then on this, actually the previous bash, I think it was the, in October, where it was found again after 37 years, recorded again on the, in this quarter degree square. So there's definitely been some some valuable records found. And then the other one I wanted to show you is the the Barrydale Trudeau's Pass um, quarter degree square, where we also up to about 25 species now, and. Uh, you can see in the bottom right of the of the square, the the twisty road. That's the Trudeau's Pass, and it leads up to Barrydale. Um, it's a really a beautiful um, pass, the, the Trudeau's Pass, and uh, it's got a nice, healthy list that's starting to grow. When we first visited it um, in October last year, there were also very relatively few records. Um, and also, I just want to highlight a couple of the interesting ones here. Um, we've, the most notable one is actually the jaunty dropwing, which was first and well, the last time it was it was um, recorded in this quarter degree square was in 1951. So that's a, a refresh after 70 years. So yeah, and, and it was in a, at exactly the same site, the, the, bot, the, the river crossing at the bottom of the Trudeau's Pass. So refound there again after 70 years. Not that it's an uncommon species by any means, but still it's nice, it's giving new fresh data into the, into the system. So just a couple of the interesting species that were found, the Queen Malachite, which um, I found at Marloth Nature Reserve, this is um, the most southernmost known locality for the species. And it was last recorded here in 2006 um, by Michael Samways himself. And um, so this is a refreshed record after 15 years. And it is also the first virtual museum record for this quarter degree square. So that was quite a nice, exciting find. Um, and yeah, that's what its map looks like now. And you can see the the little green spot on the far left is the is that record from um, Marloth Nature Reserve. So that was quite an exciting find. And um, another one that I want to just show you is the conspicuous malachite. 
another, um, both of these malachites are endemic to South Africa and they're quite um, special species. The, this one was also found at Marloth Nature Reserve. And then I found it again on the, my return home at the, on the Swartberg Pass. Um, the Marloth record is the first record of it ever in that quarter degree square. And uh, the Swartberg record is the second record from that square. And I've driven that path several times and I've searched for it every time and I've always turned up nothing. So I was very pleased to find it now. So it's, it's clearly there. It's a refresh after six years. And uh, yeah, they're just <laughs> not very easy to find. And uh, this is what its map looks like now. And uh, this little, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but that little spot there is the, the one at Swellendam, Marloth, and this is up, up here as the Swartbach Pass. So again, it's, it's helping to, to fill in the, the gaps. Um, another one is the Orange Emperor. This was quite an interesting um, species for this bash because we, we did not record it at all on the previous bash in October. Not one was seen. Um, so now we found them almost at every site we visited. Um, rivers of varying quality. Sometimes there was almost no water, yet we, we found the orange emperors. And um, yeah, and we've now added it over this bash to eight additional quarter degree squares. So um, I'll show you an interesting map now quickly on, on the next slide, which um, thanks to Karis, she, she made this for me. Um, so this is before the bash. This is the, the distribution of the orange emperor in the Western Cape. Um, and now, after the bash, you can see on the right, all these, all these um, blocks up from here, across, and all these here were all added during the bash. So it's really um, helped to fill in this gap between the sort of the garden root specimens and all the records and the, 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 the ones that are in the sort of closer to Cape Town. So helping to fill in that gap across between the two. And then um, last but not least is the epaulette skimmer, which is a species that's not found all that often in the Western Cape. Um, and uh, this is the first record of this species in that quarter degree square. This one was found in the, the Montague Nature Reserve. So I was quite surprised to see it there. Um, it's a species I'm quite familiar with coming from Kozuru Natal. Um, so I, I recognized it immediately as being, um, as not being the Cape Skimmer, which is everywhere. We found Cape Skimmer at virtually every site. It was the most common species um, present away from water, at water, and at all, all different habitats. Um, but this one is clearly a bit different. So yeah, Epaulette Skimmer was a, a good find. As you can see, it's found widespread throughout the country, but um, decidedly less common in the Western Cape as it is up in the Limpopo, Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. Um, so yeah, just another, another good record. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. I don't want to take up too much time. So yeah, thank you. Does anyone have a question? Thank you very much. That's a uh, uh, fantastic presentation. I think that there, there, there is one question. Um, uh, are the refreshes um, attributed to higher rainfall during this last year or to higher observation rates? I think it's got more to do with, with the observation rates and just getting to those sites. Um, although some species like the, the queen malachite, there, there have been other records between this record or other trips people have been visited the reserve a few times in between this record and the first record, but um, it hasn't turned up anything. Um, however, it is also a very, um, what's, what's the word, a very um, localized species that's, that's um, very, very habitat specific. So if you don't, and it's also quite difficult to get into its habitat. So for sure, there's certain species that's, that will be um, harder to come by than others, but yeah, I think it's got more to do with coverage than, than rainfall at this, on this trip anyway. That's fantastic. Well, I think a tremendous effort 
um, to get to uh, to get to, uh, coverage in uh, you know improved coverage in all of these areas. Well, wow, you must have been on the go a lot, and it seems like quite a bit of distance was travelled. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, a comment from Les well. is just saying that uh, this is one of the more intensive searches. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was saying it's 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 worthwhile to to do the travelling. I think, um, yeah, you you need to you've got such a, a short amount of time. You need to try get in as much as you can. Um, although. It works on both sides. It also limits the amount of time you can spend at any one site because you want to move around. But um, yeah, you've got to you've got to cover the cover the distance to 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 find anything. Uh, just a question from me: Do, do you find dragonflies, uh, any species, some distance from water, or is it always is water always involved? Obviously, because yes, it's an do. integral part of their lifestyle. You can actually, and the nymphs need water. Thanks. Yeah, so of course, all dragonflies and damselflies breed in water, fresh water, but um, a number of species are often found away from water. The strong flying species, as well as um, I think individuals that have, are not breeding anymore and just sort of wander off to go and, and, um, and forage, hunt. And uh, yeah, you also find females away from water more often than the males. Um, they come to water pretty much for mating, whereas okay, interesting. males occupy territories at the water. Yeah, so, but it varies. Fascinating. Ryan, thanks very, very much for your presentation. Um, Sue, I don't